Okay. Well, thanks, Maranatha, and good evening, everyone. Well, 2020 has been, in understated terms, quite an eventful year. And as it draws to a close, and as many people prepare for the festive season and, um, and hopefully a better year next year, there may actually be some who actually question the existence of God, given that everything's going on. There may be some who accept a God or gods in a variety of forms, and they may hold these different gods with different relevance to everyday lives. And so this presentation this evening, brought to you by the Christadelphians, who are brothers and sisters in Christ, aims to explore how and why the topic in question is extremely important to consider, both here and now, in 2020. And so tonight, we hope to show to you that there is a God, and it does matter what you believe. Oops, just throwing everything around at the moment. Let's make sure I've got the right... There we go. So this evening's reading that Maranatha read to us, the focus of that highlights the dilemma that has faced humanity throughout the ages. Which God? And about 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul is recorded as visiting Mars Hill. You can see um, an impression of it up there, or the Areopagus. And he delivers quite a pointed argument on who God is and his relevance in individuals' lives, then and also now. And so from the artist's impressions, you can see that it's quite a bustling place with most of the city's influential leaders and individuals present. I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest to you that the impact of Paul's speech in its context could be like visiting the Adelaide Oval. And for some strange reason, the AFL has decided to get all their teams lined up and each team is actually clamouring for the public's loyalty and financial support. And as you go past each of the 18 teams, wondering which one to align yourself with, are you going to go with the colour, are you going to go with the players, are you going to go with what state they come from, you all of a sudden you notice a stand over in the corner marked to the unknown team, just in case the AFL has missed out on a team to add to the list. So it can be easy in the light of acknowledging that there are many, many religions and ways of viewing divine presence in whatever shape or form in this global village that we call Earth. We can start perhaps grouping ourselves into parties, each claiming that their own religion is the right one. And although some might be more tolerant of others in view of this, um, but some people may feel that it's either us and it's, and it's them. So hopefully tonight, we'd like to show to you from the Bible that this God, as outlined in the Bible, is the one true God to worship. So today's objectives, is there a God and does it matter? We hope to reveal that there is one true God. We hope to show that salvation is dependent on belief in whom God is. And finally, will touch on maintaining belief in the face of, of adversity. So as Christadelphians, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of the one true God, and we'll be using that this evening to explore this topic. Firstly, let's cover the fact that there are any number of gods. You can refer to the Celtic, the Norse, the Greek and the Roman mythology. And there's a picture of Odin, who was the chief god in Norse mythology. We can even consider the Aboriginal and the Maori legends, and there's a picture up there of the, of the rainbow snake, which is held sacred by the Australian Aboriginals. You can even go with Hinduism, Shintoism, and you can even go with Voodoo and Wicca. So there's the uh, symbol there for, um, for the Wiccan belief, which is uh, very much related to the natural state of the earth, the, the fire, the spirit, the air, the water, and the, uh, the orm designed there for the, uh, for the Hinduism, which refers essentially to the creation, the development, and finally the destruction of the universe. So they're religions that cover any number of gods. And it's interesting to note, Wilkinson, a guy named Wilkinson says this, that of primal religions, he says that such deities are often distant, they're remote figures, and they communicate with humans through the religion's many other spirits rather than by direct contact. And we shall actually compare that 
with a God as outlined in the Bible this evening. Other religions who have any number of gods are those of the Eastern religions. And it's a little bit like a, a, little bit like a supermarket. You go to the supermarket each day for your, what you particularly need, but every so often you think, oh, I need this commodity or this luxury. And for many in an Eastern religion, they might focus on a particular god or goddess, and they'll address other deities when, and re when required. So perhaps uh, you might be a fisherman living on the coast, and each day you pray to the, the, the god of the storms, the god of the sea, the god of the fish. But every month you might have to go into the local town to sell your fish. So once a month you might pray to the god of travel, for example. There are religions who hold that there is one god, and probably the oldest religion of, of that is Judaism. There's Islam. There's Christianity. There's Sikhism. And that's um, shown by the... There we are. Shown by that interesting symbol there. It looks like, like swords and, um, and that, that circle, the circular structure in the middle. You may have seen it on, um, on cars. Um, the, the, area, the area that I teach, there are a lot of uh, Sikhs within the actual area, and you often see that on the, uh, on the cars in the, uh, in the nearby suburbs. Uh, there's also the Baha'i Faith. Uh, the Baha'i Faith is actually unification of different religions around the world, and they take teachings from Abraham, Krishna, uh, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, and Mohammed, and, and, and seek to unify them into one religion that anybody uh, can join, regardless of culture or background. The interesting thing to note about one God is that it often denotes a specific and different revelation from God. Within those religions that um, the focus on one God, the importance of prayer is very much a, a key ingredient within that religion. Um, those who worship one God, they value the individual believer's experience of faith and God. And it's interesting to note that Wilkinson says this, in an increasingly secularised world, there, that's referring to the Judaism, Islam and Christianity, their influence is widespread. So I just thought that's a, quite an interesting thing to note. And if we refer back to the Baha'i faith, who have taken a lot of their teachings from Judaism, Islam and Christianity, you can see that influence um, is very much within today's society. Thirdly, there are those people who hold that there are no gods and a lot of these are um, from Eastern uh, or Oriental uh, religions and it's had quite a resurgence in the last 50 or so years. Um, perhaps as those from Judeo-Christian backgrounds have separated uh, from their upbringing and, and sought other ways of living instead. So we've got Confucianism, Buddhism, Jainism and Daoism and also the Church of Scientology who you uh, may be familiar with as uh, such celebrities as Tom Cruise uh, being involved uh, with that particular uh, religion. These kinds of religions which focus on no gods, they, focus, they tend to focus more on a way of life and they might have a leader um, who, who denotes values and essentially there are, they're teaching uh, various moral values um, or what's acceptable in society uh, to, to follow. Along the way, people question the existence of a God. Um, they question God, the existence of God, because why would a loving God allow suffering? They ask the question, why would God allow his son to die on the cross in such a horrible way? They might ask, if there is an all-powerful God, why hasn't he destroyed the devil? Or why does he allow a supernatural being to defy him? They might ask that if God is the God of love, why would he let people suffer torment for eternity? How can Jesus be God? And doesn't science prove that God isn't real? And if Jesus Christ is all about love, why have Christians gone to war and slaughtered hundreds of thousands in the name of Christ? The very short and quick answer to that is that some of those teachings are not actually found in the Bible. Uh, for example, Satan and the devil, 
even though the words Satan and devil are referred to, the idea of a supernatural being is not consistent with Bible teaching. The same with everlasting torment, and also the same with Jesus being God. Now, if you refer back to the focus reading that we had this evening, um, there was a group of people called the Bereans, and they actually searched the Scripture daily. So everything that they heard, they thought about it, they went back to the Scripture, and they checked as to whether those things that they heard were actually true. And unfortunately, due to human nature, because we've been given a choice, there has been corruption of power, there's been corruption of status. Um, So ultimately, there's even been a false representation of who God is and who Jesus is. And so unfortunately, um, misinterpretations or people's own bias have led to um, a falsification of scientific principles and also a falsification of um, what is actually true and upright. And so, unfortunately, people have gone off, off to war. Finally, there's a group of people who deny any existence of God. Now, this is different to agnostics, because agnosticism um, neither denies nor confirms an existence of a God or even a divine being. Some of the reasons that an atheist, and there's a symbol, um, the American atheist uh, symbol, um, some of the reasons why atheists uh, refuse to believe in God, they question, is the existence of any God important? They argue that various cultures and animals have a particular social order, so why do you need to bring a divine being into the mix? In regards to a purpose or meaning of life, Following a God, isn't that just some sort of mindless obedience? One article I read, um, someone who had converted to atheism said, look, I'm I'm my own person. I can do what I want. I can do what I like. As long as I don't get into trouble. Why would I want to submit to a creator if I don't believe that a God created the heaven and earth? What is the will of any God and what is the relevance of the will of any God in my life? What's the importance of it? So there's some reasons why people choose not to believe in a God. And if we refer to some of the contemporary philosophers of of today, John Gray says that what we believe doesn't actually, sorry, what we believe doesn't in the end matter very much. What matters is how we live. Um, A philosopher by the name of Gary Gutting, um, he wrote this, An all-good being may have to allow considerable local evils. This is assuming that he's he's just assuming that there might be a God. He says they may have to allow considerable local evils for the sake of the overall good of the universe, but we have no way of knowing whether we humans might be the victims of this necessity. So, yeah, there could be a God, but, yeah, we don't really know. So it doesn't really matter whether God exists is the title of uh, of his book there. So if we come back to the Bible, and there are many, many people over time who have discounted the validity, the validity of the Bible, how do we actually know that the God of the Bible is the true God? There's a little mnemonic to remember certain validations of the Bible, and the first one is P, for prophecy. Lots and lots of um, prophecies in the Bible, some of them have been fulfilled, some of them are yet to be fulfilled. For example, there is a vision of the image revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, uh, which basically foretold different world religions. Um, A classic prophecy is that of the Jews returning to the land of Israel. Now, until comparatively recently, the idea of Jews having any sort of homeland was was quite unknown. There were some whisperings at the the early part of the the 20th century, but even up into the mid... um, 20th century during the middle of the Second World War, Um, some of you may know the author Roald Dahl, he was actually a a fighter pilot and he, in his autobiography, he uh, he describes coming um, into this little, um, I guess, little abode and there's actually a a man there who's looking after all these um, Jewish children and in the dialogue that Roald Dahl has with this this man, he says, look, the man says, look, we don't have a land to go to, all these are Jews we don't actually have a land um, to go to. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately for that, um, that man, within a few years, 
uh, the Jews were able to have a, a homeland of Israel. So both of these prophecies and many others are because of God revealing them to mankind. The next one is R for resurrection, and that's essentially of Jesus Christ. Now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been regarded as a myth by non-believers, but it is very much a fundable, fundamental aspect of faith for believers because as there are so many references to it in the New Testament, Jesus was raised to life by his Father, and even the disciples' courage and the motivation to preach this, despite their earlier fear and confusion, as well as the risk that they faced of persecution, is a witness to this. So we just read here in, in the book of Acts, um, very much an essential part of their teaching is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. E for, in, um, e for environment. Um, if you consider the physical structure and the function of the universe, right down to the intricate makeup of a cell, it's very much evidence of an intelligent designer. And despite whether you think how, however long the Earth uh, took to, to come into being, um, I come from a biological science background and um, no matter how much I was faced with the idea of that, it all came about by chance. Looking at the intricate uh, functions of different body organs or even within ecosystems, very much for me is, is a convincing um, reason that there is a, 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 an intelligent designer. Archaeological finds um, have, I won't say proved, um, but they have backed up the narratives or accounts of events and characters within the Bible. A famous archaeological find is that of Hezekiah's Tunnel. Um, there's also another one uh, called Sennacherib's um, Annals, and they were just inscribed on three prisms, which describe from Sennacherib's point of view uh, the siege of Jerusalem when Hezekiah uh, was king. It's actually interesting comparing what Sennacherib wrote about the, uh, the siege compared to what's actually recorded in, in Scripture. And you can see that, look, some people might question archaeological uh, finds because uh, people's accounts over time are going to be skewed according to their perspective or their point of view. However, despite that, there is an amazing amount of consistency uh, within the Bible. And if you consider that the Bible was written over a period of about uh, 1,600 years um, by different authors who themselves came from different walks of life, it's, it remains a, a quite an amazingly consistent in its message. In fact, it is quite consistent in its message. Um, some people who have brought up, oh, there's all these errors uh, within the Bible. Um, one publication um, by a person named J.J. Blunt he wrote a book called Undesigned Scriptural Coincidences, and you can actually find this online. He says that you can actually take a few scriptural um, passages that stand by themselves fairly well enough, but if you can actually link them together to substantiate each other. So, for example, in the book of Numbers, there is a reference made to giants who are the sons of Anak. So this is talking about when the children of Israel were coming into the, into the promised land and they were a bit scared because of all these giant people. Later on in the book of Joshua, uh, it says that Joshua destroyed the Anakites, but not all of them. Um, some were left behind in cities such as Gaza, Gath and Ashdod. And then later on, um, many listeners will be aware of the uh, story of David and Goliath. Goliath is a giant who came from Gath. So you link all these together and you can see that consistent message Finally, there are health laws um, outlined, particularly in the book Law of Moses. Um, they outlined that the Israelites or the Jews were uh, to follow certain eating practices. So, for example, um, they could not eat certain foods. Um, they were considered unclean. And, and back then, um, preparation of food and the refrigeration of food was not, of course, to the same extent um, as it is today. Another interesting um, article, though, it says about certain foods... Um, is that certain kinds of meat have been tested and found to have different toxic, toxic levels. Um, so, for example, those meats that were considered clean, such as um, poultry, uh, lamb um, and such like, um, the toxicity levels are very, very low. However, things like um, pig, um, bear, um, horse quite high in their toxicity levels. Um, 
so that was a that was an, just an interesting um, little interesting uh, I guess illustration of, of how the health laws um, within the law of Moses actually make sense. There is a reason uh, to it. Um, the other aspect of the health laws is that waste uh, was to be buried uh, until quite recently. Waste was generally just dumped in the street. Um, now, even though there were certain cultures at the time who had latrines, they had running water, the fact that these health laws were specifically written down shows that there was somebody who was considering, or a being who was considering the health and well-being um, of people's lives. Just a quick aside, um, I did say earlier that the Bible is our source of, um, our source of reference. However, um, there are three books here which uh, readers or viewers may be interested. Not all of them are written by uh, Christadelphians. Um, based, there are some doctrinal differences. But I've put them up here um, for the following reasons. The first one up there, called Does God Exist? Science Says Yes. Uh, it was written by a scientist by the name of Alan Hayward. He was, uh, he is a, a, was a Christadelphian. Um, he actually showed that the existence of the universe could not just be by chance. The one in the middle there, called The Case for Easter, written by, um, who's now a pastor actually, uh, a man named Lee Strobel. The author was actually an atheist to begin with, and he actually set out um, to, disprove, to disprove the idea of Jesus' resurrection. However, his research actually led him to believe that it did happen, and more importantly, to come to understand the significance of it. Uh, finally, um, some readers or viewers may be familiar with this book. Um, the book called The Purpose Driven Life was written by a, um, a, a man named Rick Warren. Um, it's a course that outlines in practical terms a series of understandings and biblically based beliefs to deal with this age-old question. Now, some viewers or readers may be more familiar with the original um, edition of this book. Um, since the first edition was published, up to the second edition, which has now been expanded, in that period, the author actually suffered a great loss when his own son took his life. However, despite the suffering, um, and obviously the, uh, the grief that this man and his family suffered, he still remains a motivational speaker and evangelist. So, she's showing these books, one was written from a scientific point of view, one was written by someone who started out as an atheist, but, um, but changed, and then finally someone who has had their faith shaken, however still remains resolute. So put these examples, and I'm not saying that these are the, an exhaustive list, but these are examples of people who have shown the validity of what, um, how God is revealed in Scripture. And as we turn to Scripture, we find that the very first contact that man has with God is quite an intimate uh, way. Now, while it was likely that the Elohim or the angels were responsible for the physical act of creating, it's, it's nonetheless pertinent that the life that is given to humanity is from God himself, where the breath of God goes into this creature and this creature becomes a living being. This, this lump of clay becomes a living being. There is a direct link established between the creator and the created. And I, th and I would suggest to you that this highlights a very particular relationship that, um, and a confidence that we can have this particular relationship. If you think back to some of the primal uh, religions where it's a very distant or a remote uh, relationship, this is very much, uh, very much a, a close uh, relationship. And this is brought about in the relationship between God, the Heavenly Father, and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're not going to explore this, that particular topic tonight, but it serves to remind us of that close relationship that we can have with God. And I think that the Bible is quite incredible in how it reveals the character of God and how he actually interacts with his creation. And later on, Jesus said that this is eternal life, that they, the disciples, they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And coming to know God, have a quick look at two things, God's name and God's character. 
First of all, God's name. Um, for want of a better pronunciation, Yahweh, which essentially means I will be whom I will be. And as I said, the God of the Bible isn't this standoffish remote being, but one who is deeply interested and invested in our lives and our destiny. Something that comes up in the Bible concerning God is that he is a jealous God. He declares himself to be the one and the only true God with no equal. And this is quite different to religions who profess that there are multiple gods, some within a hierarchy or whose worship of is dependent on the individual circumstances at the time. So you can chop and change between gods if you like. So some names that reveal God's aspect of God's character and his being, one of them is El Shaddai, which essentially means Almighty God, and also Yahweh Elohim. So El Shaddai, God's power, is denoted, and Yahweh Elohim, how he reveals himself through his power, especially at the hands of those who serve him. Now again, the names of God is a fascinating study in itself, but I just wanted to show to you that the name is more than a title or one characteristic, but it's actually a, this complex structure of personality and purpose. And that's why it does matter what we believe in terms of the existence of a God or gods or none and our subsequent result response to that. So coming back to the God as outlined in the Bible. Moses asks God to show me your glory. And so we have this passage from Exodus 33. The Lord, or Yahweh, proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generations. You shall not worship any other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And as we go throughout the Bible, we find a God who made the world and all things in it. He's a creator and sustainer of life. He's referred to as a ruler over all creation. He is described as eternal. He cannot be contained. He's present everywhere and he is approachable. He's also the father of all. He's divine. He's patient. He's forgiving. He's righteous. He is a judge. And he also raised Jesus from the dead, which is a fundamental aspect of our faith and our belief. Coming back to the idea of God being all-knowing, there are various biblical references. This aspect is quite important because we can trust that God knows what has been, what is, and what will be. And this passage from Isaiah 44. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell and will, and will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. So God is all-knowing. He's also holy or is separate from other gods or things that we might be tempted to worship. And again, there's a few biblical refer references up there. This one from the epistle that Peter wrote. And he says, basically, be like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves in all your behaviour, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So it's not enough just to know who God is and what he is like, that there's also that call, that invitation to act like God, to be like God within this mortal frame. Other things about God. God hears prayer. He is all-powerful, as we've already touched upon. 
He also gives and he keeps his promises. This one here from Acts 13. We preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise in that he raised up Jesus. He raised him from the dead. He has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, i.e. Jesus Christ, whom God raised, did not undergo decay. Through him, and this is the important part, through him, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things. Isn't that an amazing thing? And finally, faith has to be essential for salvation. If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. Your faith also is vain. You are still in your sins. Christ has been raised from the dead. In Christ, all will be made alive. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father so that God may be all in all. And this is what the ultimate of what is God manifestation, his creation showing the utmost of his glorious character forever. And so finally, the invitation to everybody. I heard, this is from the book of Revelation, I heard, behold, the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer any death or COVID-19. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And so we as Christadelphians, we believe that Jesus Christ will return again to restore this earth as to how God originally intended. Within this particular passage, we see that God's presence with mankind, it is reaffirmed. We see that God has the power to destroy suffering and death. And in fact, that has been done through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. We see God's promise. We see the reason to believe the validity of such based upon previous occurrence. This is the the God the Bible tells us about. This is the God. This is the God to believe.